Good morning, everyone. Today we are back in those beautiful premises in order to resume with the second day of our plenary session. I hope that you did enjoy yesterday's event in Yurmala, in our resort city. We also have a photographic evidence from yesterday's event. But now we will start our work today with presentation of workshops and the results thereof. I would like to invite the rapporteur of the first workshop, Mr. Agris Skudra, to come up with the conclusions of the first uh, workshop. After the presentations from each workshop, um, you will have an opportunity to comment, to ask questions, and to add your own remarks. And now I give the floor to Mr. Agris Skudra. Um, we had a workshop number one, which was about the practical aspects of judicial cooperation for the enforcement of custodial sentences. Um, our um, discussion was, div uh, was divided in four parts. We talked about general aspects. We talked about uh, practical aspects of issuing member state, practical aspects of executing member state, and a little bit we touched the role of EGN uh, in order how this um, problems and solutions could be uh, reached. Um, talking about the general, uh, we talked about the framework decision 909 uh, and about the and we what we discussed and we understood from our discussions that the level of implementation and application of the framework decision uh, varies in different uh, member states. As you know already, at the moment, it is a sim uh, this framework decision is implemented in 24 member states. Uh, for those who didn't implement yet, still conclusions could be drawn from the Council of Europe Convention on Transfer of Sentenced Persons. Um, we talked uh, as well about, we discussed uh, who initiates this process about the transfer of sentenced person. Uh, and as I already mentioned, it varies in different countries. Uh, in some countries, the sentence upon the request of the sentenced person, as it's in Luxembourg or Lithuania, upon the automatic process of, like, that the state is initiating this process is in Austria and Denmark. Uh, in, La in Latvia, for example, uh, we have that as an executing state who initiates sometimes the process. Talking about social rehabilitation and uh, human rights and freedoms, uh, there was a brilliant idea, and I, I, how I recall it was mentioned by Denmark, that uh, in terms of human rights and freedoms in uh, all European and judicial space, there, will be, there must be a mutual trust. So every country or every member state assumes that all standards, uh, that other member states will comply with uh, standards. To, uh, when we talk about, or discussed was uh, about issuing uh, practical problems with, uh, in issuing member states, we talked about uh, practical problems of issuing certificate. Mm -hmm. That is usually uh, certificates sometimes are not uh, filled in completely. Sometimes they are uh, completed with inaccuracies. Sometimes there is no stamp. Sometimes there is no signature. Um, another problem, of course, is uh, which is always a problem, is that translation of documents, uh, that in some member states they are not translating whole judgment. Uh, some, in some, some member states are requesting translation of whole judgment. Uh, then we discussed about consent of prisoners, how member states inform and gather consent of uh, this uh, <coughs> person who is sentenced. Um, Another practical problem was about the communication and requesting additional information. The main problem is, of course, when uh, there is a need to get supplementary information, there's a, a long time when you get this answer or not uh, getting at all. Uh, it, sometimes it takes two, three months. When we talk, discuss the problems of executing member state, of course, it's time limits. It's Article 12 and Article 15. So Article 12 uh, stipulates that within 90 days, 
the decision should be taken uh, whether to recognize or n not recognize this decision to transfer this person. And if so, the Article 15 stipulates that within the 30 days uh, this person must be surrendered. Um, as, uh, as we discussed and uh, my colleague Yulia was uh, sharing our Latvian experience, this problem for Latvia is resolved because in our criminal procedure law it is stipulated that uh, within the 30 days our court takes the decision on recognition or non-recognition. Uh, as, as it was mentioned in our uh, discussions in some countries there are some problems uh, to comply with the time limits. Um, talking about communica uh, communication problems between the member states of course uh, uh, there's the problems of adaptation on the sen of the sentence. There was mentioned one example uh, between Romania and Italy. The person was sentenced in Italy for 30 years, but uh, according to Romanian national law, for that, such a crime, it's only 25 years. So that's why this decision, uh, decision was not recognized. Um, Talking about role of European judicial network, it was uh, in, between our per, uh, participants of the working group, it was acknowledged that uh, practical tools on the websites are really uh, helpful, such as Library, Atlas and Fish Belge, uh, where to get information uh, from how, it, how this framework decision works and uh, etc. And EGN could be a help in order to solve the communication problems. So you always can use uh, EGN contact point if there is a need or necessary to get information on national law in other countries or procedures. And of course you can use uh, inform the EGN about the problems on the collection of statistics for EU institutions for this uh, how it was a questionnaire, and when you collect, uh, when yeah, you can put comments uh, to EGN, and then uh, EGN can help with that. And at the end, uh, solutions and conclusions. Um, as we were, as we were informed by the representative from the European Commission, uh, there's ongoing process of drafting the handbook for the framework decision. Uh, ex expect the time that it will be uh, submitted before the member states it's uh, next year hopefully um, another solutions and conclusions was tra training of practitioners especially EGN contact points because uh, EGN contact point points uh, is the first contact point is the first person to whom uh, somebody is turning to uh, in order to clarify some information on, on sp procedures or national law in specific member states. Of course, it is important to train the judges uh, at national level. Um, talking about translations, it was just maybe idea that uh, it's, it is good to translate not the whole judgment but the relevant or important parts of the sentence, uh, of this judgment. Talking about um, fact sheets, that uh, in the future there is a good idea to pr produce fact sheets in English about the national systems in each of member states. Uh, talking about in fact sheets for prisoners, um, there was the idea to produce such a fact sheets uh, in in the language of the sentence, uh, person who is sentenced, uh, and this fact sheet could be. Uh, placed on the EGN website, it's an always available uh, for a member state if there is a need to, to in that country, to uh, in, in each specific case to, uh, case to inform the, the, the person who is sentenced about uh, procedures. Um, and of course the regional meetings about uh, among member states uh, uh, that share many transfers and as we understood yesterday there was uh, lots of cases between Romania and Austria, Romania and Italy. Um, so it is important to have a regional meetings between the countries who, uh, amongst them, uh, whom there always is a, uh, there are many cases. So it was, a, in short and brief, our conclusions and solutions from the workshop number one. Thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Skudra. 
for his presentation and the solutions and conclusions. I think we should definitely reflect on that. We are happy to hear that there is also um, a handbook pending because we as practitioners know how useful it would be for us. It uh, would really help our daily work. Are there any questions, comments, or additions to the conclusions and uh, solutions proposed by the first workshop? If there are no questions, let us move on. I would like to invite the rapporteur, Mr. David Dixon, from the second workshop to present the results, outcomes, and conclusions of the second workshop. Good morning. Um, before I start, as the first um, uh, person from out with Latvia to speak this morning, um, can I first of all thank the Presidency for the invitation to attend uh, this um, meeting and can I also on behalf of everybody who's here, um, I'm sure they'll agree with me that this has been a very successful meeting uh, and uh, to thank the Presidency uh, team as well as our colleagues from the European Judicial Network to make this such a successful event and, and to bring us all, all together and um, it really was worthwhile staying on a little bit longer in Yurmala last night to see, the, uh, to see the sunset, so thank you very much. Uh, what we were asked to look at was the um, very practical arrangements for the uh, surrender of individuals, as in any issues which arose in relation to them being returned um, under the uh, framework decision. So, um, from our group, um, the position was there's not actually been a huge amount of experience in this area uh, amongst um, most of the member states, so clearly it's an instrument which we've all still got to learn um, how to use. But um, the general impression was it's much quicker than it is under the 1983 Convention, uh, and that's because um, it's a judicial decision, so very much similar to the European arrest warrant with it being a purely judicial decision uh, it makes things um, much uh, quicker in both getting the decision but also then the practical arrangements thereafter. The again general position, not entirely, but um, most um, states operate on the basis that the judicial decision is made and thereafter the arrangements for the surrender is a very practical one and is left for the police uh, or the penitentiary um, correction police to then implement. So uh, any difficulties which are likely to arise are then left with the police to, to sort out. Uh, and I'll come on to um, the, the communication at that level uh, in a minute. Um, again, it was very encouraging to see that the decision is usually made much quicker than the 90 days uh, which is provided for within the framework decision and uh, in particular that the surrender uh, took place quicker than the 30 days which was provided for within the decision. Uh, and um, when we look at other timescales in this area of work, it's astonishing to see that in particular with Estonia, that they uh, have been able to have transit agreement reached within two hours. So clearly for uh, states, uh, IMBI was uh, involved in the negotiations uh, in this instrument, so uh, that was very helpful for something we'll come on to. But um, I think, as she put it, as given where Estonia sits within the EU, it has to use, as was called, transit countries quite often, and clearly has a very good connection with those countries to obtain transit agreements very swiftly. Uh, so that, again, was, was encouraging. Time limits, um, 90 days for the decision, 30 for the transfer, and the decision on, on transit to be given within a week. So I think the general impression again we had was that this was not a problem. And in fact, everything uh, took place much, much quicker than that. Again, we had the same discussion about translation and about the level of information which was being requested uh, or, or in fact provided. And this is where it was very helpful to have 
uh, Imbe tell us about the negotiations, which was that there was lots of discussion about the level of information which should be transferred, about why that information had to be provided, and it was decided that what should be provided was the decision. And um, again, we had a very useful inter intervention from Christian Shireholt who explained that it's helpful to know, for example, under the German system, whether the decision was in absence, because it may not be recognized under German law. But in addition, uh, it's also useful to know whether or not there are early release provisions and that all of these uh, issues are contained within the judgment and therefore while the decision requires the judgment to be provided and there may be some benefit in a, a shortened essential elements of the decision being removed uh, that really it was important to get the full decision. On the other hand it was also pointed out by a colleague from Croatia that having a decision which runs to several hundred pages narrating the whole of the evidence is pointless because that's not really what is required to make the decision uh, and therefore perhaps what colleagues could do would be to identify the judgment in those cases and that would then be transferred. Um, and of course the obvious point was that <clears throat> as was made by our colleague from Italy was that if you then have these difficulties to be resolved it then eats into the time which is then to be used for decisions to be made and of course you then have delays either through trying to recover the information or then have the information translated uh, and uh, consequent delays uh, which followed. A very practical issue was um, and I think, I think we dealt with this as prosecutors in a fairly light way, but hopefully not in any, any inoffensive way to the police. But, you know, we've all come across situations, especially in the European arrest warrant context, where uh, suggestions are made for transfer on a Saturday or a public holiday to which we met with the response were not available. And, of course, the suggestion was, well, does that mean all the police in the country are at home or, or out enjoying themselves at the beach? And the answer, of course, is no. Uh, but it then seems quite difficult to actually find two police officers to deal with your transfer and the consequent delays and difficulties that that in practice can cause. Again, it was pointed out if we told each other perhaps a little more in advance and had greater cooperation, we could avoid public holidays and Saturdays, but sometimes it's, it's not avoidable. We had a, an interesting discussion, again, which kind of was informed by the... Um, practical issues around the European arrest warrant because let's be honest the issues are quite similar. Uh, we have people arrested and we have people transferred but do we actually know all that the police need to know about this person? Do we share with them a risk assessment? Do we share with them that this person is known to be violent? Do we share with them that this person suffers from mental health issues? That was given against the background of there's little point in having someone sitting on a plane ready to take off to find out that they have mental health problems and they then have to be removed or some other issue. Uh, and um, our colleagues from Finland very helpfully uh, pointed out that on the Europriest website there is a risk assessment form. It doesn't actually have, it's not very detailed, but what it has is the absolute essentials which are, should be transmitted with, I would suggest, the form, the, the, the form within the framework decision, so the police actually know who they're dealing with. So there was a perception that, again, with the European arrest warrant, it's, it's, it's nice to have mutual recognition and transfer people, but it really would be very helpful, if nothing, for the interests of public safety and the safety of police officers to know who it was that they were dealing with. Uh, Again, in terms of communication, um, it was generally thought that it should be best through Interpol, but interestingly, it was not a competence for siren, which is perhaps a little odd given the siren function in relation to the European arrest warrant. You would have thought it may sit best with them uh, rather than being through Interpol, uh, but that was the advice that we were given. And also that direct communication was not encouraged because it was confusing to the police 
I think that was in the context of if we speak to each other, then we have to make sure that the police know the position, because if not, they have the practical arrangements but are slightly out of the uh, exchange of information. And finally, just some general sources of information which we found um, useful. The com lists of competent authorities are found on that link from the Europris um, website. The implementation report, um, uh, only 20 or 30 pages, but it's very useful to uh, take you through the status of implementation and um, links to national law. And of course, again, um, as always with these instruments, the European Judicial Network website itself has the consolidated instruments, all the notifications from the states, and some links to national legislation. Uh, so even though our experience was that there had been no need to have any recourse to the European Judicial Network, uh, that again, the European Judicial Network does have a portal for that information, uh, and um, again, the, the, the assistance can be recovered from there. So um, on the basis of not a huge amount of experience, there were some real practical uh, issues which we were able to identify. Thank you, David, for the conclusions of the second working group. Uh, does anybody have any comments? There are no comments. All right. Speaking about the second working group, uh, Yes, maybe not everybody had this experience. But speaking about myself, I know that uh, in these cases, I am willing to find out more information about the things that I don't know. And those people who participated, I think, uh, have gained a lot of practical information. I am glad to hear that uh, uh, the deadlines are being uh, are being uh, complied with because uh, it is uh, often a concern for uh, the prosecution and also the police. Hearing these conclusions about the deadline is um, is a, is a very nice thing. Speaking about the information amount, it is. Uh, it is important to note that the information should be broader and uh, as detailed as possible. Now we're moving on to the next work group, number three, uh, Rapporteur um, um, Andreauska, Ms. Andreauska. Yesterday, we discussed and analyzed the relationships between the European Arrest Warrant Framework Decision and the Transfer of Prisoners Framework Decision. EGN contact points and other delegates shared their experience on using the both instruments in their member states and also pointed out the main problems they faced. The first issue raised was the fact that transfer of prisoners framework decision is not yet implemented in all member states. And uh, lots of member states have also implemented this framework decision very recently. So because of limited practical experience, now it's rather difficult to analyze all the advantages as well as drawbacks of this instrument. But still, some, some main issues can be pointed out. I'm sorry. Oh, it is. The first and uh, maybe the main problem raised is the poor quality of documents, including wrong translation. Sometimes uh, practitioners use even Google Translate for sending the documents to other country. Which is, which is not very good for work. Also, there is missing documents in the certificates or a lot of mistakes. 
also the transfer of prisoners framework decision covered the gap between the European arrest warrant framework decision and transfer of prisoner. Now, still some problems can occur when the member state can cannot fulfill its guarantees to take over this person for ex executing the custodial sentences. Also, delegates pointed out that when the person had been surrendered on the, the European arrest warrant framework decision, some member states do not provide information about the outcome of the relevant criminal proceeding. And so the member state doesn't know what has happened with the surrendered person. Uh, was he convinced, convicted or was he acquitted? Also, the contact point from Cyprus told about quite important problem that it, now it is not clear what to do if the sentenced person has a lot of obligations, financial or other, uh, um, between, uh, between the state and himself, what to do in these situations. Also, human rights issues and uh, conditions of detention can be raised when deciding. Uh, yesterday, it was also pointed out that it would be very useful to have uh, handbooks, both provided by commissions and by member states, providing details regarding implementation at national level. And for example, different member states have different meaning for the definition given in framework decision. For example, each state uh, recognizes its own meaning of the words, the residence, or what is meant to be under the meaning the person is living in the member states. Talking about the role of Euro European Judicial Network and Eurojust, it was pointed out that Internet tools of EGN network is very useful and all the contact points use it almost every day. Also, uh, yesterday the hope was expressed that EGN contact point will be mentioned which specialization has each contact point. If to speak about training for the contact point, it was also pointed out that it is necessary to provide the training by the contact point because only the practitioner can express and share the knowledges on specialized practical issues. And the uh, Eurojust should be involved when coordination is needed. So, if you have any questions, please, you're welcome to come to ask. Thank you, Maya, for the conclusions drawn. As you see, here there is also a need for a practical handbook. which would uh, explain how the framework decision is implemented in each country, especially considering that member states have different understanding of uh, the definitions of terms. And uh, speaking about uh, translation issues, I hear that, um, as I hear, as I see, many work groups have noted that it is an important issue. We can share Latvia's experience in this respect. We definitely do not work with uh, Google Translate. We have the administration of uh, courts, which is responsible for work organization at courts. There is a special department 
dealing with uh, translations. Now that we have agreed, Olaf would like to say a couple of words. And I would also like to give the floor to our colleague uh, from Japan to, ex uh, to, um, to share their experience. It will be very interesting for us. Thank you. Thanks for yesterday's evening. Uh, I hope you get a good night's sleep, uh, at least a sufficient number of hours. Um, I was just wanted to come back to uh, uh, the issue of handbooks because that is one of my my uh, dear uh, things that I'm trying to repeating. I think I've been doing that for many years, uh, and I do agree that EU handbooks is really uh, an important. Uh, um, Assistant, assistance for the practitioners. Um, and I understand now that uh, the handbook, uh, uh, there is going to be a handbook, and we have heard about it and it was mentioned several times a handbook also on, on the issue of prisoner, uh, the transfer of prisoners. So that's, uh, that's really, really interesting to hear about that. Uh, what's also important, of course, when we are having a new handbook, either, either it's the EAW handbook book that is being updated or we are getting new EU handbooks uh, provided for, I think it's uh, provided for by the Commission as, as we, we were told yesterday by, by uh, Ms. Benader. Um, I was just wondering uh, how the, uh, how, um, because I, I see it, that's very important that the handbooks also cover actually the, the practical issues on what really is important for us as practitioners to to know about. So, so I was wondering um, uh, the, the procedure for curating the EU handbooks uh, and, and maybe if the Commission could explain that to us, uh, that it's safeguarded that the, the EU handbooks that we are getting, which we are very grateful for, also uh, is taking into account the discussions that we may have like uh, on occasions like this. Uh, and I'm sure of that uh, uh, EGM would be more than willing to assist in, in, um, in providing information that could fill also the handbooks. Uh, and, and I assume also that maybe also Jurgast uh, could, could uh, gather the uh, information and is already doing that so that we will have a comprehensive uh, EU handbook really, really taking care of uh, all the things that we need to know in the handbooks. So that would be interesting to hear the procedure for, for creating the handbooks. Um, that's about the EU handbooks, but, but um, uh, then repeating myself a bit, uh, um, the, f uh, in my point of view, it's also important that we in the member states have um, um, national handbooks. So it's not, uh, it's not sufficient, I would say, to have an EU handbook. It's very good because the EU handbook gives the overall picture, it gives explanation on uh, 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 trying to give uh, explanations on, on common issues. And we also have information about um, uh, the interpretation of, of the, the um, different framework decisions in the EU handbook. But when it comes to the actual uh, implementation, the actual practice in the member states, it's also a need, and that is my experience, that each and every country explains from the point of view of the national legislation how uh, the national legislation is going to be, uh, be, uh, be interpreted and how you should read the law and, and the practical issues that arises from, uh, from exactly the, the way uh, each and every member state have uh, implemented the framework decisions. So I think it's a, it's a twofold uh, exercise that we have to do, uh, both uh, having an EU handbook but also um, uh, create um, handbooks or guidelines that are more tailor-made for the national legislation. Um, so so uh, that would be my, my uh, suggestion and proposal that we, that we really take care of this uh, together. Thank you. By Commissia Vales Mom Does the European Commission want to say something regarding the drafting of the handbooks? 
If the Commission has any information available, we would be very pleased to hear about that. At this stage, uh, the handbook of, on the transfer of prisoners is still in a, quite a preliminary uh, phase. Um, we're also reflecting on, on drafting a handbook on the probation framework decision at the same time. So, um, and we want to align uh, both handbooks. Um, the handbook on the European arrest warrant is already more advanced. And in that respect, we also uh, have had already discussions with Eurojust. Um, we will also, uh, your just will also probably uh, be able to, 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 to comment on the draft handbook. And as uh, in respect to the uh, transfer of prisoner handbook, um, the Commission will come up with a draft hopefully um, in, in 2016. And then, um, of course, it will be uh, discussed uh, with the Member States uh, in Council Working Group. And every member state will have the opportunity uh, to, to give its comments, which will then be taken into account by the Commission. Um, I, I fully agree with Ola that it would be very helpful if the member states uh, themselves could provide information on the definition of terms uh, um, in their national legislations, uh, because for, for us it's rather difficult to have an up-to-date overview uh, of all these different national provisions. So um, I, I fully agree that that will be extremely helpful. Yes, well, this. Thank you very much. The information from the Commission side was very useful. Olaf, the floor is yours. Please continue. Very useful information. So, so we are looking forward to the further development on this issue. Uh, uh, yeah, let me only finish off by uh, also from my side. Uh, thank you very much to all the moderators and the, the rapporteurs for, for this exercise. It was very useful and we have new, new uh, information and new ideas to, to continue to work on. So thank you very much for your valuable uh, effort because it's always an effort uh, to, 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 to be a moderator and a rapporteur, but it's really something that we appreciate very much. Um, another point uh, that I want to come back to, I was mentioning yesterday that uh, we on the website will introduce uh, in connection to the new home page, the new first page of the website, some information about the uh, third countries and other judicial networks. And um, we will there also include, when we have uh, finished this in some months, have included the uh, contact details of our uh, contact persons that we have in, in several third countries uh, more and more nowadays. And, and as I said, it's something that we will, will work uh, further on. So th this is something that will come in the, in the, in the near future. And, and it's uh, something that we uh, have been asking for, you have been asking for. I was asking for it before when I was a contact point, but now I am the one who has to do the job. Uh, so we will do it. Uh, but in the meantime, and since we this time have uh, um, a, a guest uh, uh, by us from, from Japan for the first time, uh, we would really like to give the opportunity at least to, to, uh, to uh, let Mr. Tomorrow Karaki to, uh, to present himself, because that's an opportunity that could be to, to be interesting to know that we, we have a, a contact person in Japan that could be able actually to assist uh, us as a contact person. So, so uh, if uh, Mr. Karaki, uh, uh, you have the floor if you would like to just say a few words uh, on, on uh, who you are and, and the... Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here with uh, uh, the Canadian colleague uh, as a third country contact point. Uh, very recently, Japanese authority established uh, contact point, including myself. And uh, we do not have any uh, extradition agreement between EU member states. But on the other hand, we have EU-Japan Mutual Legal Assistance Agreement, which entered into force uh, about four years ago. And since then, 
the request, the number of the request from EU member states to um, Japan increased uh, significantly about by three times, and also uh, the request from Japan to the EU member states uh, increased uh, almost the same uh, amount. And uh, we believe that uh, it's a strong, uh, yeah, it proves that uh, both sides and of course uh, not only others, our side but also our uh, other third countries have a strong uh, uh, needs and the EU member states have a strong need to enhance our cooperation uh, more and more in the future. So it will be uh, very useful to be here anyway. So thank you very much for everything. <coughs> Yes. Thank you very much. It's, uh, we are very pleased that you have come all the way from Japan, and we are very happy to see you here today in our plenary session. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, all the participants of workshops for the useful ideas and the practical suggestions and proposals you have provided. We would also like to thank the chairs and moderators and rapporteurs from all the working wor working groups and workshops. Uh, the council representatives also want to have a say. The floor is yours. Uh, the floor is given to the representatives from the council. I would like to give you some news from the Council of Europe. Uh, the Council of Europe, as you know, has a committee called the PCOC, which is now actively involved after we had in uh, 2013 in an, uh, in a comprehensive inquiry on the functioning of our Convention on Transfer of Sentenced Persons and its additional protocol. Uh, the inquiry can be found on the PCOC website. We are involved in updating the additional protocol first, but also the convention itself, which will happen in 2016. And that will be uh, quite an um, intensive and important uh, issue because the convention has 64 parties. So it goes far beyond Europe. And uh, not only will, because the, uh, the inquiry resulted in uh, in, in, in some comments about the uh, convention not being um, functioning as well as it should and could. It's too slow, the problems with translations, things we heard in, uh, in the working groups are also true and even more so for the convention. Uh, so we have several ideas and uh, one of it is also to introduce some practical uh, um, improvements, we are considering introducing an e-transfer tool which would allow the prisoner and the countries involved to see online how the process is going. And of course it is not compulsory, it would be proposed as an alternative, it's now being studied. But also to the convention themselves, there are uh, some proposals to uh, update and changes, this will probably happen in the form of a second additional protocol to the convention. Furthermore, I would like to inform you that there is some interesting information on the PCOC website which might also be useful uh, for you and certainly in your relations with third states, but not only. We recently updated the template for country information. And the template for country information <coughs> contains the national procedures, including the early release provisions uh, of each state. Also, of course, the authorities responsible for uh, deciding uh, on, the, on the decision, which of course in the convention uh, is a bit different than in the framework decision, but also the authorities who deal with the actual transfer. And I think these are now up to date. Almost all uh, 
parties have filled them, filled them out and they are accessible on our website and it's important. And also, as you already know, we uh, regularly update uh, a document we have on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, including on the Convention on the Transfer. And I think that is also important information. In addition, we have, because we are aware that more and more the poor prison conditions are an obstacle, not only to transfer of sentenced persons, but also to extradition and even to MLA. And the Council of Europe is having now an interdisciplinary uh, working group on dealing with overcrowding. Of course, this will not result in immediate and rapid solutions to the problem, but it's just to inform you that we are uh, working on it and uh, trying uh, to find solution, but this, of course, will be in the midterm. Thank you very much. Lies Baldis. Thank you very much, Anita, for the information you provided. It has been very useful and we are really looking forward to the updates and new developments.